One of my biggest kicks is just going out to eat or going to movies, you know, and doing things I couldn't do when I was, you know, in the middle of the Beatles stuff. And I really get off on that. And people occasionally people ask for autograph or just want to shake hands is the coolest one that happens, which is cool with me. And uh, I'm just known enough to keep my ego floating, but unknown enough to get around, which is nice. Okay. I've been a follower of you for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I gotta shake your hand, man. What's up, man? I can't believe I met you. I swear to God, how come what are the Beatles are getting back together? Tomorrow, tomorrow. You're full of it. What are you getting back together? I love your album. I like your blue album. Hey, what's that guy? John Lennon. Hey, hey, hey. I can't believe it. John Lennon. So the episodes are coming thick and fast. As I mentioned at the end of the last one, I am going to be going weekly until at least the end of March, so another six weeks from now. Today's episode, not surprisingly, since the last episode was Imagine 1988 Part 1 of 2, this is, guess what? Imagine 88 Part 2 of 2. Yeah, sorry, I wish I could come up with a surprise. Perhaps next week we'll have Part 3 of 2. Anyway, so yeah, Scott Phipps a.k.a. Bob Balaban, with me again. And we go from, I think we got up to about 67, 68 last week. And then we go, we actually spend a long time on 69, that kind of period, which the Imagine film also spent quite a lot of time in. And that sort of period's becoming more and more compelling. Another reason for that is that, in fact, I am currently researching the materials for a show about the assassination of John Lennon and the idea that it could have been some alternative to Mark Chapman acting alone, as we've seen with JFK, MLK, and RFK. Also, the assassins all have three names, I suppose apart from Sihan Sihan, but anyway, James L. Ray, Lee Harvey Oswald, Mark David Chapman. Anyways, that's for the future. Just to say, yeah, we spend a lot of time on 69 and the bed in, some amazing footage, and there's some great audio clips that I've put in. Some of them are from the film, The ones you've just heard there at the beginning, that was two separate clips. The first one wasn't from the Imagine film, but I think they may have been from the same stroll in Central Park of John and Yoko, where people come up to them and they ask for autographs, and the first person was just kind of saying, you know, I've been following you for many years. Second guy, that is from the Imagine film, is a young fella. I think they're playing basketball. And he's like, um, as you heard, you know, John Lennon, I can't believe it. I love your albums. I love all your albums, you know. But proof there that, you know, John Lennon hadn't got out of fashion with youngsters, you know, when he turned 40. That was 1980, that's just before he died. Yeah, I'm going to keep this intro short, but just to say that this is another very enjoyable talk. And, you know, we go off into a few other areas. We don't really stray too far from the subject matter because we had to get to the end eventually. We end with some um, post-1980 speculation, let's call it. So um, that's it. Very short introduction. And I'll be back at the end with a few words and to let you know what's coming next. Okay, enjoy. In this period, you're almost getting a different John Lennon every year, visually. Yes. You've already described him in late 66, early 67, then 68, you've got the centre parting and the glasses. That's it. And then we'll get to 69. He looks almost like a kind of slightly scary christ figure really yeah yeah the white suits and the and the long hair it's at yeah. this point yoko is actually introduced you know we've got mm. the famous art exhibition with the ladder mm. that you climb up and it had the word yes on the ceiling which is how we met her and you know the mm. whole thing about very positive experience if it had said what was it he said if it had said something, rip off yeah rip, rip off. off yeah he said i wouldn't have bothered um, yeah. so we, we now get to the john and yoko years now part of the documentary and the Two Virgins, the photo of the Two Virgins album cover is at this mm. point. And the most interesting part of this little bit, there's an interview they show, and I don't know if it's Dick Cavett, it's certainly one of the American interviews that he does. And he mm. talks about the time when Brian Epstein was alive. 
mm. and they weren't allowed to talk about Vietnam and the war. Mm. And he that said, was, um, Mike Douglas. There we yeah. go. Right. So he, he's now saying, well, now I can, which is why I'm taking an active interest in all of these protests and making people aware of what's going on because I wasn't allowed to previously, which, yeah. you know, before I saw this documentary, I wasn't aware of that. But it was, it was quite a thing because Epstein was a very press conscious manager. You know, he kept a tight rein on everything. So you now see the birth of a new John, almost, a more vocal John. Yep. It's an interesting phase. Mm. That clip of him, you actually see him going up the stepladder. That was yeah. a recreation it they got did. Got to be, yeah. yeah. In 71. Did you see how thin he was? Yes. Oh, my God. Because yeah. he was actually, as a teenager, because I've just been interviewing the drummer who from the Quarrymen, as I told you. Mm. Very early pictures of John Lennon. He's very, very thin and sort of bony. But yeah. when my mum was on my podcast, she was talking about how there just wasn't the food available. They weren't True. sort of uh, <laughs> shops where you could just get snacks all the time. And children yeah. did tend to be hungry a lot of the time. Yeah. But John Lennon looks amazingly thin. But I would say a lot of that is down to the macrobiotic diet. It's probably a mixture of that and, uh, you know, other things. Yeah, many other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, 69, this is covered quite extensively. I think, yeah. I felt like this was quite a long sequence. We get revolution at this point. We get the footage oh. of that and the count me out in, an explanation for that. How amazing does revolution sound? Yeah. Well, it's one of your favourite tracks anyway, isn't it? That oh, whole yeah. revolution, well, revolution like, um, number nine and all of that sort of white album period for you, I think, isn't it? It's... Yeah, you're right. After last year, mm. the 50th anniversary, I gained a new appreciation, but sorry, mm. 2018. I mean, I already loved Abbey Road. Abbey Road didn't sort of jump above the white album as my favourite. So it wasn't only because of the repackaging. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, so I've I always preferred once. Abbey Road to the white album. If you were to put those two together, I've always preferred Abbey Road over the White Album. Right. Never right. been a massive fan of the White Album. I, I like some of the quirky stuff on there, you know, Bungalow Bill and things, but I don't know, it's never grabbed me as much well, as Abbey Road. I could, I could listen to Abbey Road quite often, actually. Yeah. I think I look at it in a, in a kind of almost like a Desert Island Discs kind of way. <laughs> yeah, what one would... <laughs> if you could only have one, you know, which one would keep you interested the longest? And because there's so much on it, you know. Yeah, I suppose in that respect, yeah. And I mean... I feel like, yeah, Beatles and Lennon, there's, there's something for every mood. If you want a bit of energy and just total feel good, then stick on, you know, with the Beatles or something. Yeah. You know, if you want, I don't know, something weird, maybe a revolver, well, that's not that weird. And then if you want something that just sounds amazingly, again, slick, not meant as a criticism, mm -hmm. amazing musicianship, then you stick on the Abbey Road medley. You know, yes, of course. Yeah. Astonishingly good. Yeah. Could we talk about the bed-in footage? Because, I mean, that is just That amazing. is just coming up. I mean, we're getting up to the Ballad of John and Yoko sequence now and Baggism yeah. and this whole period. Just before they get to the week in bed, there's a documentary being filmed by ATV called John Lennon, The Man of the Decade. I don't know if footage of that actually exists apart from what we see here, but I think that would be a great thing to see if it's still about somewhere. I think it might be on YouTube. It's yeah. something like 20 minutes. Yeah. They named three people, and it was Desmond Morris. Oh, right, okay. Uh, is, he, is he an anthropologist, is that right? He is, he's the old, yeah, and he did lots of nature programs in the 60s, Zoo Time in the 60s, Desmond oh, Morris. that's right, yeah. yeah. He, he nominated John Lennon, and then the other people who were nominated was, uh, this is interesting, JFK and um, Chairman Mao, and of course, <laughs> probably before the fact that Chairman Mao was directly or indirectly responsible for the deaths of about 50 million Chinese. They didn't quite realise that at the time, did yeah, they? Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't quite, yeah. And of course, he's name-checked in Revolution, isn't he? Of course he, he is. Carrying yeah. pictures of Chairman Mao. Yep. <laughs> the amazing thing about that man of the decade is that um, at the beginning, sorry for these, uh, the fact that I'm just this font of annoying... Go for uh, it. <laughs> trippy, I'm sorry. Well, I'm finding it fascinating. I'm going back you to all these saying, YouTube clips. You know, what I'm doing, I'm saving you reading all the most recent books. So just... uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you just give me a potted <laughs> history of everything that's coming out. I'll just give you all just, <laughs> I'll give you all the bits from the recent books that weren't in the old books. <laughs> this is amazing. At the very beginning of 1960, something like March or April, yeah. John Lennon was living in a place called Gambia Terrace mm -hmm. with Stuart Sutcliffe, who yeah. obviously you've heard of. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete student residence dump. Yeah. You know, they never did any cooking no food in the fridge, all that kind of thing. Yep. A newspaper came to that flat, and um, in the Liverpool Echo, there was uh, an article that was headlined, The Beatnik Horror. Right. I knew about this before Mark Lewison's book, but Mark Lewison reckons that Alan Williams, being a bit of a hustler, got them to sort of make the flat look even messier. 
<laughs> yeah. It's not clear whether John Lennon's in that picture. I've seen the picture. I don't think any of them are John Lennon. Oh, right, but okay. It's possible. But what's so amazing is that the first few months of 1960, John Lennon was basically a bum, an art student dropout. Yeah. And then he becomes man of the decade, which is... Incredible, yeah, from, from 10 years, what a difference, yeah. Amazing. But um, <laughs> Ballad of John Yoko, again, definitely sort of loads of echo. This more or less yeah. applies to every song, I think. I didn't notice it, it on that. Up. Mm. Yep. But yeah, as you say, it then goes into the week in bed thing with that yep. incredible confrontation. Amazing. My favourite bit out of all of that is Derek Taylor losing his shit. I love yeah, Derek absolutely. Taylor anyway, you know, and, and him I just like him. being so protective about yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, go Derek. You know, I was fist pumping almost the air. You know, it's just yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I could almost tell you that word for word, but I won't. <laughs> but, I mean, some of it's amazing. Yeah, he sort of says, get out, and then he apologises, and Al Cap says, it's not for me, it's for your psychiatrist, Darren. Yeah, the man tries to have a comeback for everything, mm. but the intelligence of Lennon just shines through, and and the mm. anger in his eyes as well. Oh, it's scary. It's, yeah. It's scary to me, yeah. Yeah, and I just love that whole sequence, that whole thing that this guy comes in thinking he's going to be clever. But John Lennon's a very intelligent man, mate. There's no way you're going to get one over on him. And Yoko's chucking in some great sort of comebacks as well. You know, it's, it's explaining the two. He thinks he's being funny, talking about, oh, well, you're very high, mate, showing your genitalia to the world and being hirsute yeah. and all this sort of stuff. You know, I think some of that was quite amusing. It right? was. It was funny. because You could tell he'd, he'd scripted that before he'd walked in the room. Maybe, yeah, yeah. And he's thinking, I've got to get that line in. Not realising that John Lennon's just going to slap him back down, no matter yeah. what he said. Everybody <laughs> owes it to the world to prove they have pubic hair <laughs> and you've done it. And, exactly. And then John Lennon says, I'm glad you noticed. Or something <laughs> <laughs> very funny I'm not sure exactly what Al Cap's stance on the war was but I think there's an undercurrent of probably anti-war pro-war and I think Al Cap probably saw them as sort of a bit naive and a bit beardy weirdy I think there's a, definitely an aspect to that it's, it's sort of the attitude that well what right have you guys got to protest you're, you're just a songwriter yeah. you know and, and you're then, just lying in bed you're not actually doing you're not anything you're actually actually doing anything and then John Lennon mm. comes back with that comment about I could write a song and make more money in a week from that song mm -hmm. than you could make in a year or something, he says. you know. And it's, yeah. I just love it. I love that whole five-minute sequence of this documentary. Yeah. Did you see that little shot where you see all the cameras Yeah. very, very close in? I mm. don't know if it was like that for the entire week. Yeah. That's heavy. I think they probably took it in rotation. I don't think the same... Mm -hmm reporters were there day in day out you know it would have been yeah. bbc there on the monday itv there on the tuesday whatever it may have been you know international press on this particular day and of course yeah. you've got timothy leary there and petula clark was in that crowd Petula's as well clark, wasn't yeah. she yeah now i'll get to that in a sec i just mm. want to finish up with this al cap because yeah. there's, there's amazing exchanges there's an extended version again it's somewhere probably youtube but mm. uh, and i've seen the transcript of the whole thing and there are a few <laughs> bits that you can't hear exactly but there's a bit where she says, you know, you and I are married together in this world. Mm. And he goes, that's a very unkind thought to plant in my mind. You know, I'll wake up screaming or something <laughs> like that. He has got a funny delivery. I'll give yeah. him that. But yeah. he actually says a couple of, um, I can't remember exactly what he says, but he starts getting very offensive. Yes. He says to John Lennon, you have to live with that. Yeah. Now, uh, Harry didn't punch him in the face, I don't know, because that's that's yeah. his wife he's sitting next to, for God's sake. You know? Well, I suppose if you're doing a bed-in for peace... For peace, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, the, you can just see the anger is evident on oh, Lennon's face yeah. throughout that whole thing. You can only push him that far. Oh, he also yeah. calls her Madame New. Yes. Do you know what that's about? No. Well, she was actually the South Vietnamese... I think his name's Ziem. Was, hmm. um South Vietnamese president that the Americans were actually backing. So it maybe it wasn't as big an insult as it seems, but yeah. I think he was like a bachelor his whole life and she was his sister, mm -hmm. but she was considered the first lady. They weren't oh, married, they were brother and sister. Right. There was nothing weird about it in that way. But yeah, yeah. He calls her Madame New and I, presumably she didn't have a good reputation or something. That was a bit <laughs> cheeky. Well, one of the things that uh, interested me was the the method you've chosen, you, this is to inspire peace, clearly. Yeah. yeah. We try to sell it like soap, you know, and the only right. way to sell is to focus attention and sell every day. Well, you feel that like being in bed compels more attention than if you were sitting on chairs. Yes, yeah. and it makes it easier for us because we talk ten functional. hours a day yeah. and it's functional yeah. for us to be lying down. Uh, what Chad are you doing about it? What am I doing about it? I'm cheering the police. <laughs> That's well, precisely what I'm doing about it. Why? 
Now, now, you people have a home in London. Are you permitting people to come in and defecate on the rugs, smash the furniture, and beat you up? Violence, 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 conversation instead of you know I, I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted Christian with any conversation Central. okay I, I you know I'd like to add to what you said about Joe Myers you know <laughs> it's good to just I can see why you want please God knows you can't have much do you think I, that people I, are shy I'm have to following with your description talk. of yourselves as if would you that consider is yourself a shy? picture of two shy people, okay, I'd like to know what shyness shy? is. May I ask you, would you consider yourself shy? Oh, I am just normal, but I think that everybody owes it to the world to prove they have pubic hair. And you've done it. <laughs> you've done it, and I tell you that I applaud you for it. I mean, if you I, want to prove it, you can prove it. Yeah, I don't feel that there's any great interest in it. Clearly, you must have felt the world wanted to know what your private parts look like, and you now the world it knows. The lyrics go, Christ, you know it ain't easy. You know how hard it can be. The way things are going, they're going to crucify me and you, baby. And then in the lyric, you said they were going to crucify you. Yeah, if you take it literally. Well, how did you mean it? I, I, I know that. Uh, it means everything that. you want it to mean. Well, what did you want it to mean? Uh, they're going to crucify you? me and you and everyone else. If he's crucified, you well, I haven't, crucify I haven't said that they were going to crucify me. I'm I not, have. I'm not. I have. You make the claim they're going to crucify you. Well, me. If you're going to take it me literally. Me you. Me and, and I stay the way I, I don't want. permit you to speak for me. Oh, well, I, I took for? that liberty, Mr. Cap. Well, it's too much of a liberty. Well, speaking on behalf of the uh, people in general, you know, in a poetic sense. You're speaking sense, for I yourself. Hope it you. Now, you're not my spokesman. Are we agreed? <laughs> I'm everyone's spokesman. No, you're not mine. It's I don't say I people. am speaking for John Lennon. World. As a representative John, of the human race, I'm speaking it. for us well, all, whether you like it or not. Whatever race you're the representative of, <laughs> I ain't part of it. Uh, who do you write your cartoons <laughs> for? I write my cartoons for money, just as you sing your songs. Oh, exactly the same money. reason. Yeah, but and exactly the same reason much of this is happening, too, if the truth be told. But if do you think I could earn money by some other way, by sitting in bed for seven days, taking shit from people like you? Oh, I, could, oh. I could write a song in an hour. Oh, yeah. Now, no, no, look here. Now, don't say this. You got in the bed so people like me yeah, right. can't see you. Yeah, right. Not for money. That's what? what you're saying. You but I can earn money but in I tell you easier what ways do you harm. than doing this. I'll tell you what would do you harm. So could I. I could make a lot more drawing people like you <laughs> than confronting you. And I must say, it's much more right, appetizing okay. drawing them because I can leave. I prefer singing to doing this, but, but I'm doing this for What you've reason. just done is when you said taking shit from people like you. Now, I was invited here. You knew I was coming. Yeah, sure. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So, so we're not doing it for you me. Have, you, you indicated I was doing it for... Oh, oh, you have matters? I'm your guest. And really... And I'm yours. You no, know, you're not. This is your bedroom. I'm delighted to have met you, Madam New. And J.C. Great meet you, Barabbas. But I'm sure the other three guys are Englishmen. What does that mean? <laughs> You think about it. You know, it's a great deal for Pete, Mr. Gass. We don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? And then the brilliant thing, you know, he goes to the lyrics of Baldur John Yoko as, as Al Cap's walking away. He goes, Christ, you know it ain't easy. Yes. You know how hard it can be. The way things are going, they're going to crucify. <laughs> Cap. Yeah, it's, it's my favourite or one of my favourite segments of this whole movie. Yeah, yeah, maybe my favourite. And obviously the longest as well. I think that's a good five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, they, they devote quite a bit to this. And that's a major part of it, this whole thing. Mm. You know, the bagism, the, you know, bed for peace, the whole thing. Grow your hair, the lot. Yeah. Maybe at this point we need to backtrack a bit because we've got the rooftop. Yeah, this before, came, um, the rooftop yeah. concert came directly after the week in bed sequence. That's right. It's a little bit of a backtrack because yeah. obviously that was January, but, you know, mm. same year. There's a little bit of footage from Let It Be. Which... Again, looking amazing because all we've ever had is a sort of on bootlegs, Dutch imports. Mm. You've probably got the film and I've got yeah. the film is is the grainy stuff. Yep. And there was a bit of this sort of pristine stuff on the anthology, but oh, can't wait for later this year. Well, when it all comes out. I mean, for, for me in 88 when this came out, that was probably the only time I'd ever seen any of the Let It Be footage up to oh, this yeah. point. There was a bit in Complete Beatles, you know, those little snippets, you know, we, we've been mm. starved of it, you know. And it's only sort of recently in the last 20 years that or even 
15 years that I've seen the whole thing properly as an adult. So that was interesting to see. You know, there's that famous bit in Complete Beatles where Paul is having a go at George and George is like, mm. I will play whatever you want me to play, just yeah. tell me sort of thing, you know. So that's the only bit that we were all ever familiar with. So we've got this wonderful bit of footage from Let It Be here yeah. going into the rooftop concert. Yeah, and interestingly, the rooftop, that's a live version finally. We don't get At last. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. it's the bit where he forgets the words, isn't it, as well? He forgets yeah, the words. Yeah, yeah. I, I said I wouldn't mention the Ruttles, but in the Ruttles, uh, Ron Nasty, who's a John Lennon character, mm. he pushes someone off the roof. Because <laughs> <laughs> on the real one, there's a guy, because John Lennon couldn't remember all the lyrics, like mm. particularly Digger Pony, it's yeah. all that indicate which way the row, syndicate, you know, like, <laughs> difficult lyrics. There's a guy crouched. With the lyrics, so in oh, the rattles wow. that you just see, just run nasty, <laughs> just give him a quick push off the roof. So. <laughs> and in there, the, the, the song is like, just get up and go instead of get That's back. It. Get you know, up and go, right. yeah. yeah. The, the actual breakup of the group itself is sort of signposted literally by Paul quitting. That's how it's announced here in this documentary. Mm-hmm. There's a headline, Paul quits the Beatles. We get a few Vox Pops and a bit of reaction from female fans saying it's the end of an era. Yeah, I like um, that. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. It's sort of glossed over. The whole, be- oh, there you go, Beatles broken up at this point. That chapter's closed. Yeah. Well, in a funny way, it's all leading to 19, well, not 1980, him, him dying, but the sort of, perhaps the, what you might call the party line was that mm. he'd kind of matured by 1980. Yeah. In a funny way, it's all leading to that. And obviously the tragic events is a, is a horrible twist, if you like, to the story. Yes. Yeah. You could almost have made this in 1988 with John Lennon alive, presuming that, you know, they're telling the world that he's a happy guy, mm-hmm. you know, which if you read the Fred Seaman book, yeah, again, you have to decide whether that's uh, <laughs> bullshit or not. Yeah. He doesn't come across as happy. But do you know what I mean? If you took away the murder, you could almost make the same film. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, it would have be... it as a sort of happy ending, 40-year-old house husband with a new baby kind That's of thing. it, and probably still recording two or three more albums under his belt at that point as sure. well. Who, who sure. knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, and then there's that great footage of... I mean, I love the song God. Yes. You know, from Plastic I love that song. And yeah. again, uh, again, loads of echo and everything on it. And mm-hmm. They show, I think, a bit of footage of all of them, like getting into cars and stuff, don't they? And That's it. It's the end of end of a journey. Yeah, and you've got John Lennon sort of sitting back. I think he's on a boat or something, smoking that a cigarette. It. And then as Ringo's getting oh. into the car, someone puts a floppy hat on his head. Oh, that's right. Yeah, which he yeah. takes off and hands it back to someone as he gets back in the yeah. car. I don't know where that <laughs> came from. <laughs> I love those little touches. Yeah, but that, that's it. That door is closed now. There's very few references to the Beatles coming up now. It is solo mm. John Lennon or it is John and Yoko's story from now on apart from yep. the next sequence where we see George Harrison at Tittenhurst and recording How Do You Sleep that's a wild version because you've got John Lennon using the C word there. it's there yeah I've, 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 got, that, I've got that in my notes I've, yeah <laughs> I've never seen that in any of the other nope. Give Me Some Truth or nope. Above a Sony Sky yeah do you think George played on that song almost like as a professional duty or do you think he wanted to stick the knife in? What's your gut feeling? Uh, I'm going to go with the second one because of that whole going back to the Let It Be footage when mm. you can see that Paul McCartney is still treating him like that 15-year-old boy that he was when mm. they first met. He yeah. was the youngest Beatle and he will always be the youngest Beatle. It, I just think it's like 10 years of bitterness. is just like, <laughs> you know, yeah. well, I'm going to do this with John, fuck it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone made the point on my podcast, actually. Uh, even when George Harrison died, I don't mm. know if you know, but the three of them were in a room together. and they, Or they had dinner or something. George was obviously going to die soon in yeah. 2001. Mm. They had dinner and him and Paul. And obviously all the bitterness had gone because you suddenly realise it's, it's such a silly thing. I mean, humans are so, we're all so stupid in a way. <laughs> that, you know, if one of us was you and I or me and whoever else or you and whoever else, had had like some acrimonious thing, and then we found out one of us had two hours to live. It It'd all be, goes out the window. Yeah, best moves, right. yeah, always, yeah. But the, the thing I was going to say is that um, someone, uh, I think it was off mic actually, it wasn't actually on the show itself, said that when Paul McCartney, he made a kind of a speech, you can see him next to his car mm. when the reporters are asking him, and he obviously wants to make up for the fact of the John Lennon, It was a, it's a drag so he's got this lovely speech, but he calls him my baby brother. Mm. Someone on the show was like, well, hang on a minute. He's only nine months older than him. Yeah. That means that at some stage, you know, 
at that stage they were both like 58, 59. Yeah. What's the difference? <laughs> Why do your baby brother is nine months, you're 59 and he's 58? You're the same year at school, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I think unintentionally, we're almost sticking the knife in the yeah. final thing after George is dead. You yeah. Know? I think that was meant as a kind of, my guest meant that as a kind of pithy comment. You know? Yes. Yeah. As, as I say, <laughs> there was always this thing, I think, that George being the youngest always got sort of pushed aside, I think, you know. But of course, John kind of got a free pass because he openly ignored George's songs a lot. Mm-hmm. You can hear him sort of saying, I'm E Mine, which in the end, I think I'm E Mine is fantastic. Yeah, like recording the Three Tools. Mm. It was the first yes. Three Tools recording. Yeah, of course, yeah. But John openly sort of slagged off George's songs, but he kind of let him off. I think George did hear I worship him a bit. I think if he's honest. Yeah. I think John was a bit more like his big brother. You know, like if you had a big brother who was kind of very daring, you know, and would say stuff that you'd never say. You would kind of look up. Of course, to him. you would. Yeah, a bit of admiration there, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Yeah. The next point we get to is at Tittenhurst, where John and Yoko are in bed, and he's reading this correspondence and letters that he's got. And there's that one particular letter, somebody claiming that they've contacted Brian Epstein on a Ouija board, you know, predicting that he will be assassinated. It's quite chilling when you hear that. That looks like sixty-nine, doesn't it? Because he's got the long hair, and yeah, the, and the beard. So they've gone back a little bit, but um. Yeah, and then they make the joke that Paul McCartney's alive in London, which is obviously a, <laughs> a reference to Paul is dead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, just, it's yeah. just chilling, though, when you think about it, because it's obviously been inserted into this documentary because of what happened in 1980. Bit of a precursor, mate. Yeah. Can you imagine, though, what kind of mail John Lennon must have got through the 60s, both with the Beatles and with Yoko? Well, looking at that guy that turned up on the doorstep, you know, that was camping well, out yes. in the grounds as well, it was just all around him wasn't it it was just constant this is why i think we mentioned this when we spoke about the original imagine movie that they just had to get away and it was their only way of having some sort of break from that six years of complete scrutiny being under the microscope all that time Mm. but obviously it still continued you know even though he wasn't a beetle anymore and he was trying to do his own thing you're still going to get the obsessives out there of course you are yeah, and I, th- I think it contributed to his sort of seclusion in the Dakota because we'll get to 75 to 80 in a second, but right. it doesn't really give you any indication that there was anything going on later on apart from baking bread and looking after Sean. Yes. Yeah. I think we know now that he kind of smoking a bit of weed and sort of staying in bed kind of cocooned yep. to some extent, but I think he was driven to that. To Isn't that what the rest. William Goldman book sort of dwells on a bit? It's, it's that, Albert Goldman. Albert Goldman, sorry. That, wasn't that the controversy when that book came out, that it was mm. depicting him in this really dark manner that nobody was aware of, and they, people rejected it, saying, oh, he's made it all up? One of the shows, I don't know if I told you this earlier, mm. I'm going to do a show called Coleman or Goldman, mm. which is the Ray Coleman, very sanitised version. Yes. And the Albert Goldman, the other extreme. I mean, mm. there's, there's other stuff in Goldman's book. I mean, one of the most shocking is apparently John going to Thailand and being involved with... Uh, Rent Boys. <laughs> Blimey. I mean, of a young age as well. I mean, I've never heard anyone come up with that. But, no, I've read the Coleman book. in fairness, book. Mm. some of the stuff that, that's in Goldman's book is starting to come out, and the truth is, right. rather than his stuff being co- completely rejected now, those who kind of care to look into it are finding the truth is somewhere There's more an in element the middle. there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So I've read the Coleman book, which is one of the first in-depth biographies, wasn't it, I think, that came yeah. out. And because of all this controversy with the Goldman one, I, I never bothered. You know, I, thought, I don't want to read that. It's some sort of spurious mm. accusations. I don't want to be part of it. So never bothered with that one. One example of something that's in his book that's turned out to be true that Ray Coleman would probably never have believed was mm-hmm. that Yoko went back to heroin in 1980. Before he died? Yeah, before he died, the beginning oh, of 1980, right. which is it's just one of those things that I don't know whether Ray Coleman would have known anything about that. He probably yeah. wasn't that interested because he's doing a John Lennon book. But yeah. Just one example of those things. And what we're getting to actually in sort of 73 is also the fact the FBI had a, a big file on John Lennon. Mm. And um, that's one of the things that wasn't really acknowledged. That would have been considered a sort of conspiracy theory as well. Is this about the same time that Elvis Presley was um, inducted as an FBI agent? Yeah. <laughs> it's about that time, wasn't it, Richard Nixon? <laughs> yeah, I read the Garolnik two-parter on Elvis yes great ago. one the yeah, Memphis thing yes got it mm. god that's absolutely I mean that, that was chilling mm. I, I read massive 1200 page volume or something in about yes. three weeks it great was a journey book. with Elvis the last few years was just so horrible but Elvis was dosed up on prescription drugs but yeah. because they weren't illegal he 
kidded himself that he wasn't a drug addict and he went after drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. He used to he flash the FBI that. badge, didn't he? he was just <laughs> yeah. Apparently, yeah, from reading this book, when he went to see Nixon, I mean, he was oh, well done Yeah, yeah. There's that famous photo, isn't it, of him shaking hands and he's wearing the white Vegas suit, isn't he? It's, yeah, Absolutely. incredible. Incred- it's a very good book, actually. I might reread that as well. Last Train to Memphis, isn't it, I think it's called. That's it. It was a two-parter. Yeah. I, yeah. I like the stuff um, where he's talking about drugs. And John Lennon was always very, very informed about, well, obviously because he had experience of drugs yeah. himself. But he said a lot of stuff that, you know, if you were to believe that his assassination had more to do with um, just Chapman, hmm. Some of the stuff he said, you know, he was really saying you need to think about why people take drugs, you know, and trying to just stop young people having sex or taking drugs is pointless. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, you know, on mainstream TV, they probably, you don't really want people questioning things too much, you know. <laughs> what do you think could be done about drug overdosing in well, or out of the profession of I music? I think the, the basic thing nobody asked is why do people take drugs of any sort, from alcohol to aspros to hard drugs? And that question has to be resolved first before you think, well, what can we do for the poor drug addict? Why do we and you and anybody have to have these accessories to normal living Mm -hmm. to live? I mean, is there something wrong with society that's making us so pressurized that we cannot live in it without guarding ourselves against it? Mm -hmm. So it's that basic, the problem. I think if people are allowed to be a bit more free and express themselves, they wouldn't have to inhibit themselves by taking drugs to not be hurt. People take drugs and drink so as they don't feel what's going on around them. People are frightened of freedom. They think freedom, oh, there'll be excesses. Of course there would be excess to an extent and then it would settle down. Mm -hmm. And uh, all forms of freedom will be the same as that. If people are allowed to be completely free, it will level out and people will be less inhibited and not be frightened of each other and wouldn't have to take drugs to prevent being hurt by each other. After the, uh, the chilling prediction from the post, mm. we meet Gloria Emerson. That's right. Yes, yeah, so we've gone back to 69, because that's 69 as well. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, we, you pointed out before, didn't you? We sort of bounce from year mm. to year backwards and forwards in this particular segment and there's this lovely sort of exchange between the two of them quite heated at times you know i've grown up you obviously haven't brilliant (laughs) yeah it's interesting stuff gloria emerson was a newspaper reporter i take Mm. it was that some sort of documentary i don't know what that footage was from it was yeah it's a it's a documentary that may be online or not i'll put a link if it is it's called the world of john and yoko oh right okay and as you can imagine it it's basically the wacky world of john and yoko yeah and um, there's one amazing clip, actually, which is John in 69 watching the Some Other Guy clip from 62. <laughs> and he's looking at himself from seven years earlier. Wow. You don't really see him comment, but yeah, that must have just seemed like 700 years ago. You know? It's a completely different person as well, you mm. know, in, in attitudes as well as appearance, I'm assuming, yeah. you know. Did you think Gloria Emerson, did you get the impression she's kind of not allied with Dow Cat, but sort of that? cynical thing that thinks that they're being a bit childish and silly about the I a bit like the earlier interview I think it's just right. one of those people that have just got this high handed opinion and won't listen to anybody else's you know my, my opinion's right I don't care what you say and thank god John Lennon was an intelligent man to actually stand up and counteract whatever argument she was throwing at him if I'm going to get on the front page, I might as well get on the front page with the word peace. But you've made yourself ridiculous. To some people, I don't care. If, if you're co- too good for If it what saves you're doing. lives. You don't think you. Oh, my dear boy, you're living in the nether, nether. Well, land. Uh, you talk to. You the, don't think you saved a single life. Uh, we, maybe we'll, well save something in the future. Maybe next year the it, didn't, it didn't do a bit of use. No, it's still gone down, so it didn't do anything. What do you know about a protest movement anyway? I know a lot it about it. It's a lot human. more than Did sending you your chauffeur in your car person. back to Buckingham you're Palace. You're just a snob about it. The only way you're to a make... you fake. Can't you give up something else that would mean a little bit more? It doesn't, it's not the sacrifice. You can't get that into your head, can you? It was no sacrifice to get rid of the MBE because it was an embarrassment. Then what kind of a protest was, did you make? You I said, mean, I don't know much did about an Nigeria. advertising campaign for peace. Very Can you understand one. that? No, I can't. A very big advertising I campaign for peace. I think it's self aggrandizing well, Are you advertising oh, for Lennon or Do you want, do you want nice middle-class gestures for peace Maybe. and intellectual manifestos written by a lot of half-witted intellectuals? 
and nobody reads them. Uh-oh. That's the trouble with the peace movement. I mean, I can't think of anyone who seems more remote from well, the ugliness of what's someday. happening than you. Well, I, hope I you do see you getting up on a Tuesday morning and thinking, let's see, what should we do today and what war is going well, on? Well, that's your imagination, you know, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, you carry on. You you. Make, why don't you make a film while you're at it? I'm someone who admired you very much. Well, I mean, I'm you sorry know, you liked the old mop have... tops, dear, and you thought it was, you know, it was very satirical well, and Cash witty on the and you liked Hard Day's Night, love, but I've grown up, but you obviously haven't. Have you? Yes, folks. What have you grown up to? No, 29. Yeah, it's just strange. Some people are like that. I, I don't know. People just have these opinions, and Gloria Emerson, just, I just got that impression that she was picking a fight with him for some reason. She just had right. this, I don't know, hatred of long-haired hippies. Who knows? Scott, can I just ask you what your general opinion is of the bedding and that whole idea? What do you think? <sighs> I've never been a peace-loving hippie myself. A lot of the attitudes amongst the reporters at the time, I know it was just attention-seeking, but there was a genuine message. He believed there was a genuine message, him and Yoko. And if it got attention, their job was done. Personally, yeah, fine. To me, it just adds to the mystique of John Lennon. And as I say, there's three or four different John Lennons we said. And that particular part of his life is just fascinating. I mean, I've got nothing for it, nothing against it. Mm. It's, It's just part of the whole mythos of him if you know what i mean and, and unfortunately it's, it's the part of him that a lot of people remember him for certain people when you mention john lennon that they will picture the white suit the long hair the round glasses the big beard yeah. that john lennon people don't remember 1980 john lennon and they tend not to remember hamburg john lennon you know and i think the general sort of impression amongst people that aren't into the story as much as you and i are mm. is that era 69 john lennon i think and it's the the peace-loving hippie with the bagism and all that sort of stuff, you know. Well, he's so visually striking as well. I mean, yeah. He's a remarkable... Of course, he does look a bit like Jesus or, mm. or the representation of Jesus, of course, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I think you can't discount the fact that drugs, mostly soft drugs, I imagine... I mean, OK, they, they were doing heroin in 69, but I don't... I haven't done heroin myself, but I don't mm. know whether heroin is one of those drugs that would affect... that's sort of psychoactive in the sense of changing your ideas i feel like that's more of a sort of pain relief almost you know but something like weed or lsd is more going to change your attitude and i think there was a bit of a i don't like the phrase airy fairy but mm. you know I'm trying to think of i think they were sincere i think they were you know it was a bit kind of crazy and i don't even mean crazy as a negative thing you know he was eccentric he was definitely did things on a whim if there is a sort of artistic personality he definitely had it yeah but he also was very aware of how powerful his influence could be because he was known worldwide and he was a member of the biggest group in the world. Whatever he does, people are going to pay attention to it. So, yeah, I think he was genuine in his entire reasoning behind all of those little protests or whatever he was doing, bed-ins and growing his hair, whatever. Mm. And also, probably, might have been bored. He's just come away from, you know, the spotlight. I wouldn't say he was seeking media attention as such but using his power to influence i'm, I'm sure yeah. that's all behind it yeah and i think you know because the we've, we've already talked about like the british media and tabloid media but what you have to try and avoid to be really media savvy is to not give them anything that they can kind of what's that phrase a rod to beat you with or whatever it's yeah called, that yeah phrase. and i mean it's not on this film but hitler at one point someone asked her Hitler, sorry. <laughs> Let me go back. Sorry, sorry. Yoko, at one point during the bed in, someone says, Oh, what would you have done about Hitler? And she says something along the lines of, oh, I would have gone to bed with Hitler or something. She didn't say that. But... <laughs> and in a, in a sort of roundabout way, she's probably trying to say that, you know, you could sort of get to Hitler or, you know, something like that. Yeah. It, it would be possible if you took a different approach, you could reform Change it everything. or something. Yeah. But unfortunately, she said it. <laughs> And I, I've never seen a cartoon of, you know, Lyoko and Hitler in bed, but I'm sure someone came oh, up. I bet something. there's something out there. Man. Unfortunately, you know, the media is a game, as I'm sure you know, and it's got to be very, very clever and savvy. <laughs> <laughs> the next part is the confiscation of the pornographic artwork, as they call it. And then this FBI report about trying to deport John Lennon. Was that the actual mm. basis of the report, wasn't it? There was actually a campaign to get him deported from America. Yeah, well, the whole thing with Nixon was about the de- deportation. Of course, they, they brought up the drug bust from 68. I yeah. think they were looking for for things. We, we're moving into the 70s now, and it is the decade that really develops now. 
you know, again, this is a kind of a government tactic, probably, when they want to get rid of someone, yeah. Is this the, but, the basis of that documentary, The US Against John Lennon or something? Is that... Yeah. That's sort of what this focuses on, is it, in that documentary? Oh, 100%, yeah. Yeah, because I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. Haven't a, seen a, that. A, there's a good interview with... Um, they went on Dick Cavett's show, and yeah. I really like Dick Cavett. Oh, I anyway. do, Second, I do. If you ever get a chance to see the Janis Joplin interviews he does... There are rumours flying right? about that they had an affair, yeah. And yeah. He was very, very close to Janis Joplin. He had great admiration and probably went a lot further, as you say. Yeah, But yeah. Dick Cavett, yeah. absolutely fantastic interview. I like him. Still going strong now, actually. Yeah, yeah he is, yeah, yeah. And um, the second time John Yoko were on with him, the first time was the one where we talk about one of our talks. <laughs> I've lost track, to be honest, <laughs> when he's wearing the army jacket. But the second one is 72. I think he's wearing the dark clothing. And um, mm. uh, what's her name? Shirley MacLaine's on it. Oh, right. Yeah. She was campaigning for um, McGovern, wasn't it? Yes, I think she would have been, yeah. yeah. And John makes a joke about, oh, as long as it's not McCartney or something. <laughs> <laughs> something like another little dig, he just has to poke it a little bit more, doesn't he? Of course, yeah. <laughs> we, we get come together live at this point as well. I just want to say about mm. that, um, John Lennon, of course, didn't perform much. He never really did a tour as such as a solo performer. And actually, a lot of what he did was charity stuff. This was a charity event. Uh, he did a Lou Grade benefit in 75. Wasn't this Sweet Toronto about 72? No, that was 69. That actually. was, oh, it was way back. Okay. Yeah. That wasn't a charity event, no. Right. But in the 70s. Mm. What do you think of the live performance come together? See, I like it anyway. I love seeing any live footage of him away from the Beatles because we've all seen that Cavern Club footage or we've Chase Stadium or the Hollywood Bowl, whatever it may be. But mm. to see him. As a solo artist, yeah, fascinating. He's good, isn't he? Yeah, because it's the same performance where we saw Mother right at the beginning that's of the film. That's it, yeah. But one thing that's hilarious about that, if you watch Yoko, if you ever see that, I don't know if it's on this clip, but if you watch that, the whole concert's on DVD or video. Mm. Yoko's just banging away at these keyboards, and there's no <laughs> keyboards in any of the songs, and, and, her, and her keyboard <laughs> wasn't plugged in. She's just furiously banging it away at it. And I, just, I love it. It's like it's like the clip of her knitting when they're yeah. doing instant karma. It, it's just brilliant. I love it. No, I, I am a sucker for sort of eccentricity, I've got to be honest. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating to see any concert footage of the great man himself. You know, I love it. Yeah. And it's good. He does that bit where he goes, over me, in a sort of camp way. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was always one for playing up on stage, isn't it? You know, yeah. we, we spoke about the pulling the faces, the gurning, the, the funny dances, all that sort of stuff. And he carried it on, even through the solo career, obviously. So Never took it too seriously. Of course he didn't. Never took anything too seriously, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we get to the Lost Weekend. We get to May Pang, who makes an appearance. Oh, we get to my mm. the gorgeous May Pang. Yeah. Still looking gorgeous in 1988. Yeah, yeah we get the whole part of that and... Um, this must be about the time we recorded the rock and roll album because we got the mm. performance of Stand By Me around this point as well in the documentary. And they talk about, yeah. obviously, Elton John and Harry Nilsson, Ringo, Bowie, all those people that were all part of the entourage at the time. Yeah, there's that brilliant bit. There's a guy called Tony King who used to work. You know the, the camp guy when they're doing the dancing? Yes. Remember that bit? That looked quite a bit like Bobby Davro. When I <laughs> that I is what Bobby actually Davro. was Bobby Davro, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and someone shouts out Fred Astaire and Ginger Beer, which is that was it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, to be honest, there's so much to say about the Lost Weekend. Now, Scott, you will know what's the origin of Lost Weekend? 1945, Ray Milland yeah. film, Best Picture Absolutely. winner. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think that's ever quite been. I mean, it's been mentioned in books, but I don't think people actually quite realise. They think of Lost Weekend that he was lost, and I'm sure there's a bit of that, but mm. he specifically, I'm pretty sure, he specifically called it that because of this film, because Ray Milan was an alcoholic and John was... It's got, there's got to be some relationship to it, isn't it? Because it's the only other reference that I can think of. I mean, Lloyd Cole had a hit in the 80s called Lost Weekend, if I remember right. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. But that's the only other sort of reference to, to that phrase I've ever heard. And, mm. yeah, it's the only thing I can think of. You know, the title of a, a major Hollywood movie, as I say, it won Best Picture in 45, I think it was. Oh, yeah. That's uh, Billy Wilder, isn't it? It is a Billy Wilder. I think Ray Milan might even have won the Best Actor as well. Certainly nominated for it. Oh, interesting. So that's obviously where it's come from. Must be, yeah. So this... Um yeah, this period is quite contentious. I mean, he made, uh, well, no, he made Mind Games just before they split, but he made uh, The Rock and Roll. I mean, that's obviously another story, <laughs> those yes. sessions. Yeah. And Walls and Bridges. But even the official story now is that Yoko more or less set him up with May Pang because she'd worked for them. You can see her popping up in stuff in 1970 and 71. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Just very, very briefly, she pops up. She's on one of the Dick Cavett shows. Yeah. In a bag, actually. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. But um, can I ask you what you think about that period? And then I've got so much to say, but I'll try and hold back. A bit. It's, it's the period I don't know too much about. As I said to you when I first sort of met you and we were chatting away, mm. my favourite era is early Beatles. I'm more rock mm. and roll John than Pepper John. You know, I'm firmly entranced in that camp. The only sort of knowledge I have of it is is reading the Ray Coleman book and bits and pieces I've picked up on, say, anthology and other documentaries and stuff like that. Okay. It, it's just a very bizarre arrangement. But then, as we've mm. said before, you know, their whole relationship was very bizarre. And it was done, I'm assuming, yeah. to save their marriage. But it's quite a drastic way of, of saving somebody's marriage, to be honest. You know, just be given a free reign in an open relationship. I mean, I don't know, was she carrying on at the time as well? I don't know if there was anything happening from her point of view, but... Yeah. Um, Would you mind if I just tell you and the listeners kind of mm, what I know about it? I mean, Yeah, go on. You can I'll, I'll, me. I'll very much summarise. Official story is more or less that... Um, yeah, Yoko wanted to split with John. I think they'd just spent, you know, five years in each other's pockets. Mm. So I think it was just a fairly standard thing that happens. A very intense relationship, two artistic people, drugs, etc., etc. Yeah. The Maypang had been working for them. Perhaps, you know, Yoko thought, well, Matt John likes Oriental women again. I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> for generalizing, but who knows? Yeah. So May went with him to Los Angeles, and he kind of needed someone to take care of him well, okay, sexually is one thing, but yeah. also she was quite efficient. And the story goes from her book and from other people that they obviously had a sexual relationship. Yeah, She writes about when he was really drunk, you know, it was very, very dark, you know. She could sense things in him. She said that when he took drugs or when he got very drunk, he had this horrible, confused look on his face, like a confused child, she said. Oh, right. Mm. So there were a few episodes where he was really plumbing the depths. And what a lot of people say is that Yoko was just constantly on the phone to John. Mm. Uh, we're not sure exactly who initiated those phone calls. Right. And in May's book, which again may be biased, I mean, I've given up trying to work out who's telling the truth and who isn't. <laughs> you know, you just take it at face value, yeah. use your intuition. Yeah. Basically, May says that in the end, John went back to Yoko because he had a childish dependence. That he and he called her mother, didn't he? He always called her yeah, mother. Yeah, he could push the right buttons. And do you know all about the stuff with the curing smoking and the hypnosis? No, no, I don't think so, no. Okay, just very, very briefly. So John and May were together. I think May was actually a real girlfriend. I think they probably did fall in love. Yeah. And she was good for him. She was encouraging him to get back with Paul McCartney because they met in um, New Orleans mm. and May have got back together. And I think May says in her book, you know, I didn't want to be his mother. I wanted to be his girlfriend. I wanted to encourage him to... <laughs> yeah. You know, not to have that dependence. So anyway, so they go back to New York. They're going to get a place. And then Yoko calls John to say, oh, there's a hypnotist who can help you cure smoking. John goes to see Yoko at the Dakota, sort of disappears for a day or two, goes back to May. And May says, oh, what happened? And apparently, and John looked very kind of, I don't know, a bit sort of spaced out mm -hmm. and said, oh, Yoko's allowed me to come back. Final point, that yeah. John actually was still seeing May Pang up to possibly 79 Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. Are you anyway, implying a, anything about this song, hypnotist right? then? Are you you're implying that something may have happened with this hypnotist? Yeah, again, you know. <laughs> Conspiracy it, theories abound. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, there's, there's <laughs> sort of two camps. I mean, there's a guy called Fred Seaman who wrote a book. To me, it kind of rang true. In fact, I made contact with him. I'm going to try and get him on the show this year. Mm. And then there's a guy called Elliot Mintz. Oh, it's the guy that he's oh, on know the beach with. Remember when John's wearing those amazing flares and yes. they're walking along the beach? yes. He is very much a Yoko mouthpiece, hates Fred Zeman, and he will give you the sort of Yoko-sanctioned official line. So, I mean, <laughs> oh, who knows? <laughs> wow. Yeah, because he's, he's in this documentary as well, isn't he? He's as, um, a contemporary interview, isn't it? Elliot Mintz, is it him? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought I saw. I like, I like that interview on the beach. It's quite good. Yes, yeah, really cool. I'm uh -huh. exhausted now after that summary. So, uh, <laughs> can I throw it to you? Oh, well, the next part... Is we, we touched on this briefly before, is in New York and Woman is playing in the background and it's that very bizarre naked bed romp. <laughs> bed romp. <laughs> it's almost, almost like what they call it a sex tape now. For, for somebody, well, we know they're not averse to being photographed and filmed being naked. Look at the Two Virgins album, for God's sake. Mm. But, but this, yeah, very, very intimate, you know. <laughs> 
dropping the barriers completely here. Mm. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the official video that went with Woman. I know that for a fact. <laughs> that wasn't shown on top of the pops, mate. I can guarantee. You. I think that was, you know, Walking on Thin Ice, the one that he was recording. The yeah, night he died. That's a great track, by yes. the way. Oh, yeah. I love that. Mm. Brilliant. I think there was actually the video for that. Ah, think, but they played Woman over the top of it for this. Yeah. 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 I think we may have touched on this earlier, but Woman has got these. Um, they bring out these harmonies, these sort of oohs in the background. Mm which actually make it sound like a very different recording. Slathered yeah. in Echo again. I actually quite like it, but it's another guy I've done podcasts with who absolutely just hates any time you do anything like that. So. <laughs> We're getting towards the end here, mate, if truth be told, because the next point is Beautiful Boy and Sean, which we mentioned the change of lyrics as well. For Darling Sean and Darling Boy, wasn't it? I think you said before. And it's sort of the double fantasy era. This is all just wrapping up the last sort of 10 minutes. Written in three weeks, apparently, they they revealed on the documentary. I don't want to come across as a cynic, but I'm I'm just interested in truth, you know. I Mm. mean, I think one of the reasons I'm doing my podcast, I find, I feel like there's still a few holes here and there and stories, (laughs) but there's a bootleg called Between the Lines, which covers 75 to 80, and he was writing continuously, so he's telling a bit of a porky pie there. Ah, uh, right, so there's there's older tracks on there, basically, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, it's... I mean, definitely when he was in Bermuda, which is there's these famous Bermuda tapes where he was ringing Yoko up. He was double tracking demos and then ringing her up. Mm. I'm sure, you know, he wasn't lying completely. I mean, there was there was stuff and he was touched with inspiration. But some of the songs were sort of cobbled together from a couple of songs that he'd be working on for years. Yeah, and, right. As I said, it's only just to give a detail that people may not have heard. That's all. Yeah. Nothing. I it's mean, really. it's, it's Double Fantasy has got starting over on it, if I remember mm. rightly, which... Is still one of my favourite John Lennon tracks, probably because it sort of harkens back to the rock and roll stuff. It's it's a very mm. sort of like fifties sounding track, yeah. And I've always liked that. I've always liked starting over. I mean, if if I was pushed to name my favourite Lennon song, I think it may actually be that, rather than you know some of the bigger ones that people would know. But that mm. one, when I was a kid, I was only like ten when it came out, so I don't know. Just instantly sort of appealed to me. I've always liked it. Yeah, I think it. Must have been like a natural choice for a single because it's just with the title, you know, yeah. and the theme of it. Oh, yeah. It was a big event, actually, when that came out. I remember it. It was mm. just like, oh, Lennon's back sort of thing, you know, and this is the stuff we like, you know. It's it's that sort of music that we're used to. So, mm. yeah, always remained a favourite. Quite surprised, though, that both the single and the album didn't really go anywhere near number one. I nope. think they got one of them got to number eight and one of them got to number 12 in England. Yeah. And obviously they got to number one a few months later for possible, mm, yeah for the worst possible reason but, yeah. uh, which we will get to now because that is the last part of the movie it's the death mm. the vigil outside the Dakota we get the interview with Julian and Cynthia and Sean Sean appears at this point as well uh, and Yoko yeah just before that you get the Central Park that guy asking him for his autograph do you remember that that's it he's through walking through oh of course yeah that, that's it again fascinating bit of footage just it is. yeah because he goes up to the fence doesn't he the guy shakes tries yeah. to shake his hand from the basketball court yeah yeah and he's going when are the Beatles getting back together and John <laughs> if you listen John says oh tomorrow <laughs> good. yeah when we did our first show together, we spoke about the original Imagine film, and you asked about my history of exactly, yeah. the Beatles. And, and, and I said to you, you know, obviously I was aware of the Beatles and big Beatles loving family. My uncle is the biggest Beatles fan I know. And we spoke at length about December the 8th, 1980, and how it impacted me personally. Because I was, I, was, I was old enough to remember Elvis going. I was eight years old when Elvis died. But it didn't mm. affect me as much as this did. Yeah. And I just remember the footage and the tributes that were being paid. The BBC showed the Shea Stadium concert and Hard Day's Night and Help. You know, it was just everything. And it was that Christmas. It always, in the run-up to Christmas, I'd always associate with John Lennon. A horrible, horrible time. It was. It really just put a weight on everybody's shoulders. Everybody was affected by that that I knew. Yeah. They actually show a little, um, well, you hear a little clip as well of... Uh from the interview he did from the day he died. I mean, I've only ever listened to that once because I don't really want to listen to it, but mm. little bits pop up. And there's that chilling bit where he says, you know, I always consider my work to be one piece and it won't be finished till I'm dead and buried. And I hope that's a long time. <laughs> that's the same day. It's like four hours, yeah. five hours before. And weren't we saying that the Andy Peebles one was a few days before, wasn't two, it? D- yeah, two yeah. days before. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that one. That they 
I think Radio 1 put that out on the 10th anniversary. I think they had this big special, mm. Andy Peebles. It was his recollection of it, and then they played the whole thing. Well, I think there's a clip. Um, I can't remember where I found it. Somewhere on YouTube, there's a clip of him on a TV show, I think on either the 9th or the 10th of December, because he basically flew back. Oh. And I think he found out, I don't know if it was on the flight. Someone did the story that they were on their way flying back and the stewardess was in tears. I can't remember if that was him, but... right. He flew back really happy with this interview and then finds out that John's been killed. I mean, the montage here, when I was watching it, I was thinking in view of what you'd said last mm. time. I was thinking what you would have thought of this montage because it's... That, it, just the memories came back. Yeah. It was it was the news footage. It was just constant. You know, mm. it's the death of a pop star basically mm. was eclipsing everything else in that run up to Christmas. Yeah. Just took over, took over the airwaves. I've talked to people on my show before about how the public, rather like with Princess Diana, they chose to remember mm. the peacenik. But I think it's fair to say that Yoko and the John Lennon estate have kind of pushed that over the years. You know, everything is like the peace sign and, and everything. Yeah. But I think when the public does immediately remember you in one way, I think that's genuine. They haven't been brainwashed because no. it's happening immediately. But fair play to the BBC mm. at the time, as I remember, mm. as I say, it was the run-up to Christmas. And that side of it, I don't think they focused on, because I remember them showing Hard Day's Night Help. Yellow Submarine was put on over Christmas, I believe, that year. And do you know what? I think they may even screen Let It Be, but I cannot be 100% sure. That may have been the last time it was ever seen in any sort of public format. And everybody who was anybody was being interviewed. We talk about Jerry Marsden on The Complete Beatles. They dragged up mm. everybody. You know, Scylla was there, the lot, you know. Remember it going right through sort of January, February even. Mm. And looking at the footage on this, it was like the news, you know, the news footage that we were seeing at the time from the BBC or ITV or whatever. Reporters outside the Dakota, you know, that vigil, the candlelit vigil and all that stuff that was going on, you know. That's right. Well, I think what I was getting at really was with the vigil and everything, this incredible outpouring of grief. All I was trying to say was that before his sort of peace nick image got magnified, I mean, yeah. that's an immediate reaction. So I think... He obviously did have a genuinely profound effect on that generation's lives. Of course yeah. he did, you know. Yeah. But in the film, just in case anyone's listening to this who hasn't seen the film, I imagine they probably have, but mm. they basically play the the orchestra build-up from A Day in the Life. Yes. And then um, it gets to the, the bit just before the piano chord comes in at the end. Mm. And then they, they do this sort of very, very quick montage of pictures of John Lennon from 1980 all the way back to when he's a child. Yeah. Yeah. And they close up on him as a baby, just as the music's ending. And at the same time, you get uh, all the news reports, a yeah. montage of news reports. It's very, very effective. Just chilling. And the glasses actually. flying in the yeah. air as well. Yeah, that bit always sort of bugged me, the actual glasses bit flying in the air, because obviously right. they've recreated that for this particular documentary, you know. And it just seems a little bit out of place. But yeah, that's a bit gratuitous. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you're like, oh, you have to take a little bit of a intake a breath with the combination of, of that crescendo as you say yeah i suppose you know i think you told me on the other show that they had hours of footage of this so they must have chosen it quite carefully mm -hmm. i mean she got into trouble because she made an album in 83 called season of glass that actually had the real bloodstained glasses on on the cover yes yeah obviously there's two sides to that so one person could say oh you know she's trying to sell albums and she could say well i'm trying to show the violence is uh, the it's harsh a reality. Actually, it's a, it's yeah. a little bit like um, Jackie Kennedy was still wearing uh, the, the dress, wasn't she, when Johnson was being sworn in on the plane? That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, the, literally, that was only hours away, though, wasn't it? It was the time between him going to Park, is it Parkfield Hospital? I think it was, yeah. and and then getting back on that jet was only an hour or two. You know, he was shot at twelve o'clock, and she was back on the plane at four. I think it was, yeah. and that's that's quite a chilling photo, actually, when you see her standing there and you can see the blood on the skirt. Yeah. And unfortunately, her and Yoko, they have this terrible thing in common. That I mean, I can't even imagine how you would ever recover from that trauma, both Jackie and Yoko. Yeah. Seeing your husband, regardless of whether John and Yoko still had a good relationship, that doesn't really make a difference. <laughs> of course still, it does. had a bond. Yeah. But to see that happen right in front of you and all the shock of it and the, oh, God, let's yeah. not dwell on it. But you know <laughs> what I mean? They have uh, All You Need Is Love, don't they, in the montage of the vigil. Again, you know, choosing that song, that's kind of giving you an image but uh well the crowd are actually singing it aren't they as well there's this footage of the crowd singing all you need is love yeah yeah i think they took to singing that and give peace a chance give peace a chance they? yeah 
Oh, we had those interviews as well, the, the final ones, with Julian, Cynthia, Sean and... And Yoko, Yoko, just the last sort of final comments, yeah. Poor old Julian, it's so sad, isn't it? Because mm. he says there was no wall between us. And, yeah. You know, we were becoming close. And... Yeah, it's just horrible. Sean was a young boy, Julian was mm. just getting to know his father. Horrible, same as anything like that. After that, it goes into the, the famous footage of Imagine, the white room, the white piano, the shutters... Mm. Mm. which is quite fitting, bearing in mind the title of the documentary. So that was played a lot, if I remember rightly, mm. after December the 8th. That was always, you know, a, a visual focus that the news picked up on as well. And we get the end credits with, quite fittingly, In My Life playing in the background. So, yeah. But, but as a documentary as a whole, anybody that hasn't seen it or anybody that wants a little bit more info than you could probably get in other documentaries, I think this is mm. great. This has got a little bit of everything. It rushes through the Beatles stuff. Quite mm. rightly, I think, because it's not a Beatles documentary. And it focuses on 67, 68 onwards, I would say, is, is the real focus. But when we mentioned earlier, fascinating to see things like Aunt Mimi being interviewed and, you know, some of the other guys that were there at the time. And, and footage that you wouldn't have seen anywhere else, you know. I would say... Um I mean, everyone knows, everyone's heard of John Lennon, <laughs> like Muhammad Ali, you know, yeah. you can't possibly not have heard of them. But yeah. anyone who sort of wants to, you know, maybe a young person, for example, who wants to get into him, it's definitely a good start off point. Oh, All I'd so. say is that, you know, it's worth doing a bit of extra reading after it, because this is kind of the official line. But, yeah. yeah. It's fine, it's fine. Yeah, as you say, just any of the um, the biographies is, Ray Coleman was always a good starting point for me. But the real starting point for me, as I've said many times, to you is the Philip Norman chat book. You know, that was the yes. one that really told me the whole backstory. I'd like to see something done in the future. I'd like to see a new version of a an official documentary, if at all possible, mm. because this is now, was it 1988, isn't it? So yeah. it'd be interesting. I mean, obviously this year would have been his, was it his 80th birthday? And it'd be the yeah. 30th anniversary or 40th anniversary 40th. wouldn't it 40th anniversary of his death so oh. this would be a big year this year might yeah, be a will be. good opportunity for them to put something together hopefully mm. there's one okay documentary called The Real John Lennon on YouTube mm -hmm. and it's a bit of sort of the other side of the story like I was saying to you earlier yeah but, um, as I say and I've come to the conclusion that I, I'm never going to know the truth I wasn't there so <laughs> yeah. all I can do in this podcast is provide some kind of entertainment and uh, a little bit of you know, information and yes. things like that. Yeah. What else can you do, really? <laughs> but no, it's been fascinating, mate. Over the, mm. the two shows, you know, not comparing the two documentaries, but sort of dissecting them with you. It's, it, and it's mm. gone on a lot longer than we actually thought we'd have. We didn't think we'd have yeah. this much to say about it, to be honest. That's the we? story of my uh, <laughs> podcasting career, which has been a year so far. <laughs> can I end with a question to you? Yes, sir. This is something we've talked about on the show. What do you think John Lennon would have done musically... Had he lived? Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thinking I, about the trends of music. I like to think that he would not have gone down the same road that McCartney did. Post-1980, if his relationship with Yoko had continued, hmm. if they had split up, you know, his musical direction could have gone a variety of ways. Hmm. I like to think that Beatles may have got back together for Live Aid. You know, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. It could have been yeah. the big thing, but... I don't know. I could see him not pouring out as much as, say, McCartney did. Mm. I think he would have been a bit more selective. Yep. I probably would imagine he would have been doing a lot more collaborations. There would have been, like, an album with Clapton. There would have been an album with Elton. You know, something like... I don't know. It's interesting mm. to speculate, but... Yeah, yeah, just to speculate. I mean, the one that we all agreed on, I think it's three people I've talked mm. to about this, we all said he might well have done something with Kurt Cobain or at least would have met Kurt Cobain. Really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, grunge, he would have said, you know, if he'd been on, um, <laughs> well, I suppose Twitter wasn't around the 90s, but yeah. he would have been on some kind of media saying grunge is, well, there was uh, us in Hamburg, then there was punk, and then there was grunge, and it's all the same thing. And he's so kind of true, he'd... except grunge was a little bit, Nirvana stuff's not complicated musically, but there were a few bands who were very, very proficient, mm. like Soundgarden, someone like that. Yeah. And it was a bit more complicated than punk. But you think I that would have appealed to him, yeah? That new movement would have been right up his alley, basically. It would have been, I think yeah. so, yeah. Mm. 
I think we'd have seen a bit more rock and roll roots eventually again. There would have been a rock and roll album part two, possibly, with other I th- standards. I think, you know, of all, all his sort of inconsistencies and whims, I think rock and roll is the thing he would have gone back to. Yeah. I mean, he already had, had he, with, mm. with Double Fancy for yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. It's interesting. Mm. I think he would have done the anthology. If you really analyse the anthology, the, the interview bits, you can, Paul's loving it. Yeah. Ringo's into it because mm. he's Ringo and he likes everyone being together, but... George is almost taking the piss out of it a bit, and I think John would have been like that. Can you imagine? That would have been the four of them together at George's yeah. house, like, you know, as you see in Anthology, sitting yeah. there by that lake. Yeah, John would have been making very subtle quips, I and, bet. And he'd probably still be having a little dig at Paul as well, <laughs> yeah. pushing those buttons, mate, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> And then poor old George being the peacemaker, just, you know, oh, I don't care, I'm just here to make music, you know, just help you. <laughs> like yeah, that's it. Oh, very interesting. Mm. Of course, there's one one representation. I haven't seen the film yesterday. I think you have. But I've seen the Robert Carlyle. Could you just very briefly comment on that, mate? It's an interesting what if, mm. you know, that he's become this lonely hermit and Carlyle actually does look how you would imagine John Lennon to look at mm. 79 years old. But again, I think your favourite representation of him is Ian Hart, isn't it? I believe you told yeah, me. Yeah, doing a podcast about that in about four hours. <laughs> oh, are you? What one? The Backbeat or Hours no, of the we're Times? No, um, we're doing a John Lennon on film. So we're going to look at all the good and bad representations of him on film. Yeah, yeah there are a few. <laughs> We've got a list, yeah. It's going to be loads of fun. Is it more it? bad than good? Give us a sneak preview. Is it more bad than good? Most of them are good. Oh, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> We've got six or seven good ones and yeah. then... Two or three bad ones, but even the bad ones have got sort of virtues. <laughs> there's only one I can think of that just seems completely pointless, and it's a TV movie that probably most people haven't seen. So, Okay, that'd be interesting. <laughs> I'll look forward to that, mate. I'm sure anyone's really totally captured him, but Ian Hart came pretty close. Yeah. He did two films called The Hours and Times, yep. Backbeat, and then there's this one that uh, a lot of people haven't seen called Snodgrass that I'll put a little link, mm. and that's a What If John Lennon... Had quit the Beatles in '62. Yeah, looking out for that because you told me about that before. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Thanks very much for doing this. We did two episodes over a couple of months. <laughs> the first one was in November, I think, wasn't it? I think it was before Christmas, mate. So absolutely yeah. fantastic. All right. So we'll just do the official goodbye. Just stay on the line for a sec. And um, yeah, thanks for doing this. And uh, just tell the listeners that we'll be working in the future, won't we? You are yeah. joining me on at least two of my podcasts two of my many podcasts so hopefully you're going to be reviewing something on real britannia i think we've, we've decided we're going to do how i won the war yes we will make sense be an of this show as well, yeah so makes sense lovely. to do that and you've yeah. also been invited on the stinking paws which is my classic movie podcast films podcast i'm there i love it more than welcome mate i've had so much fun over these past couple of episodes so i'm going to return the favor and you can be a guest on mine. Fantastic. All right. Thanks very much, sir. Cheers then, Anthony. Thank All the you. Best. Bye. So there we have it. Another episode in the bag or in the can. Either of those metaphors works. Or are they analogies? I don't know. I'm kind of just talking and free associating because I've got basically nothing to add. But I feel like I have to do an outro. What do we normally talk about with outros? Well, obviously the next show. And the next show is going to be... As I just uh, told Scott, actually, a look at depictions of John Lennon on film. If you're listening to this as it's coming out, sort of mid-February, that should be out again in a week or so. I'm going to try and keep up my once-a-week thing, as I haven't got too much else (laughs) bothering me at the moment, just uh, teaching English online. But, you know, it's a manageable amount of classes. After 17 years, it's getting difficult to retain any enthusiasm, but it's not the student's fault. And... uh, Quite nice. I've been. I'm teaching mainly French people, and so um, this habit that nearly all students have of translating from their own language it started to annoy me in Spanish when I actually knew Spanish with French. And suddenly refreshing all this stuff I learned at school like 25 years ago or more. So, uh, anyways, so yeah, it's the next one. Fascinating course to speculate about what John Lennon would have done. You know, I might end up asking all my guests that. I don't know. I think the grunge thing, as I said. Uh, Makes sense. I can imagine him doing more with um, Elton John as well and Bowie. And I think, you know, him and Marco would have got together. But thinking about it, you know, we were talking about the anthology, Scott and I, at the end of our talk. I was thinking, I'm not sure exactly how long those four would have stayed together if they had got together for the anthology. I think 
there was already needle between Paul and George sort of surfacing after just a few recording sessions. So I don't think it would have lasted long, but it would have been fun to see them together. So I will see you very soon. Thank you very much, as ever, for listening. The numbers are getting better all the time. Ah, see what I did there? So um, your continued support is always much appreciated. If anyone wants to buy me a Rolls Royce, of course, feel free. But uh, just sharing the podcast around makes it all worth it. You know, when I get nice messages and uh, had someone send me a bunch of John Lennon bootlegs. So thank you, um, that person. You know who you are. Thank you for listening as well. And um, the final thing I wanted to say actually is just to say once again, ratings, five star hopefully, and reviews would be very, very helpful. I'm sort of climbing up the iTunes chart slowly, but um, it doesn't matter how good the product is if no one's heard of it. So, um, you know, it's work to get it out there, but uh, slowly but surely it's growing. So um, final thank you, and I'll see you very soon. Take care. Goodbye. got the message over roger and i think the message is catching on the peace message chuck don't you think so chuck the peace message is catching on right he thinks so and we met a lot of groovy people and made some good contacts right for tomorrow for tomorrow who knows